following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. Welcome to Meet the Author. My name is Della Kidd, and I'm here live at the MTA studio. I'm going to start off the show with a riddle. What does a fortune cookie, plus a pair of moccasins, and a can of sardines, and a theater ticket all have in common? I'll give you a hint. They have something to do with today's author. Joining me in the studio is award-winning author Sharon Creech. She'll be sharing her ideas about the writing process and we'll be talking a little bit about her books. Some of Sharon's book titles are Chasing Redbird, Ruby Holler, and The Wanderer. Sharon's Newbery award-winning title is Walk Two Moons, and her most recent book is called Replay. If you like stories with humorous and courageous characters who tug at your heartstrings, you've come to the right place. Sharon, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. It's great to have you. We have a great show planned for today. We're going to open up our phone lines and we welcome your questions. Our number nationally is 1-800-231-6359. If you're calling us locally, you may reach us at 703-978-1636. Sharon, I know the phones are going to ring off the hooks in the next 30 minutes, but we've also received many, many emails, so great. I thought we would start with the emails first. Great. All right. This first question is from Nicole and Aaron. They're at Morningside Elementary in Florida. They want to know, where do you get your ideas for your books? Uh, it's a hard question for any yeah. author to answer, and my ideas come from all over the place, but I can give you an example. A lot of them come from my family. Mm -hmm. When I was uh, living in England, for instance, uh, I was missing my family, and I thought, well, I'll write a story about them. That would be a way that I could revisit mm -hmm. them every day. And so I started thinking about what it was like in my family. Um, out of this came absolutely normal chaos because really that's what it was like growing up with five children in my family. And I started out with the characters' names. The boys have the same names as my own brothers. The girl's older sister's name is different. But out of that came this whole story. And it was just, it wasn't really my family once the story mm -hmm. took hold, but that's where the germ of the idea came from. So often it's something real that sparks it, and sometimes I'm not even aware of that, but later I can see that almost every book has something that goes back to either a place I visited or lived or someone I met or right. saw. Because I know there are a lot of connections to Ohio, which is where you grew right. up. Right, that's right. Yeah. Um, our next email question is from David. He is at Windmill Wind Point in elementary school in Florida. And he and many other students, they all share the same question mm -hmm. for you, which is, did you always want to be a writer? Uh, no, when I was young, I wanted to be so many things. I wished you could be every job for about six months at a time, but I wanted to be a reporter, a singer, a dancer, an actress, and a, a, r a writer was one of those mm -hmm. things. But I couldn't sing, so that fell by the wayside. Neither can I. <laughs> <laughs> then I couldn't dance, then I, you know, all of those things, for one reason or another, I could not find myself fitting very comfortably mm -hmm. with. But I could use words. And I discovered increasingly that that's the area that I was most comfortable with. And it allowed me uh, a chance to create a world through words. It was something that was exciting to me, something that I could do that I was good at. And so that's because I know you were a classroom teacher. Right. I, mm -hmm. was, I, was, I worked as an editorial assistant, and then I was a classroom teacher, and I got to teach great books. And it was really through teaching those great books that I learned what makes a good story, what makes a bad story. And that was a great education for me, just teaching right. for 15 years. And you transitioned from being a teacher to a writer. How long was it before your first book, book was published? Well, I, I, it wasn't very long, actually. Uh, I was lucky in that I was living in England at the time, mm -hmm. And I found a British agent almost right away in the first mm -hmm. query letter I sent out, and she agreed to represent me. And then it was about six to nine months, I think. She had a, a few publishers turn the book down. The first book I wrote was for adults, 
um, and that book was then taken about nine months later. So I was really very fortunate. And then that same publishing house took the next uh, book, which was Absolutely Normal Chaos. They suggested it was a children's book, so they published it through their children's department. And uh, they asked for another book, and the next book was Walk to Me, which kind of changed my life in many ways. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> so you haven't really had to experience the multiple rejection letters that a lot of authors have to experience. No, I didn't, not with the books, but uh -huh. before that I, I did write poetry and I sent poetry out mm -hmm. to a lot of journals and I frequently got rejections, but I always understood that was part of the process. It was sort of, even if you got something back in the mail, <laughs> even if they were returning your manuscript with a no mm -hmm. stamped on it, there was something about that, I thought, okay, this is the process. and one day someone will put a yes on it and one day someone did and I think that's that's something that a lot of young writers don't understand is that it's okay to be rejected because right. you just haven't found the right place for what you've written and it's okay to feel discouraged just don't give up right we're going to take another email question this one is from Kyle Sean Holly Shannon and <laughs> Carolyn they're from Bonnie Bray <laughs> Elementary School in Virginia and they want to know who was your role model growing up? Mm, you know, I think I had many role models, and they all were strong women. Um, my mother, mm -hmm. for sure, she loved words. She was a very strong, feisty Italian woman. My grandmother, the same. Uh, my sixth grade English teacher, Miss Soller, was just a remarkably inspirational person in that I think she encouraged me at every turn. You know, you mm -hmm. can do this, you're good at this, try this. I also had a, a wonderful 12th grade English teacher who really introduced me to great literature, to great British literature at that time, that's, which is what we were studying. And he was the one, I think, who recognized that I was able to use words in a way that other students couldn't, and I got a lot of encouragement from him. That's wonderful. Our next email question is from Samantha at Edgar Allan Poe Middle School mm -hmm. in Virginia. She writes, and this, I think this is an excellent <laughs> question, she says, you are so good with knowing how young people think and feel, whether they are happy, sad, or confused. Does that come from remembering what it was like growing up or from thoughts and experiences from your children's lives? Mm, I think from both. Um, I can remember very clearly all those, that turmoil of emotions mm -hmm. when I was young. And I remember vividly from my own children and from students that I taught and from students on campus where we live now. But also I still feel a lot of those same things. I don't know <laughs> what that says about me, maybe that I never grew up, but I think um, all adults you know, feel we're hurt sometimes and we're happy at other times and some things make us feel good and some things not. So it's not difficult to tap those same emotions when you're older. That's right. You, you, your emotions stay the, the right. same. We, right. we have the same emotions even if we are getting older. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we just try to not show them Exactly, <laughs> exactly. We'll take a short break, and when we <coughs> return, Sharon Creech will share some insights about her books. Coming up, it's Write Tracks, writing tips for students by students. It's important to write in your own words. Don't copy other people's work. Use notes to help organize your thoughts. These tips will help you stay on the right track. Meet the author and get the full story, the back story. You guys are actually the first to know about this. I haven't even told my editor about this idea. The revised story, the author's story. You just do it. You read, you watch, and you write. And sometimes, quite a story. Writing isn't a job. It's a way of looking at the world and meeting new people. Meet the Author, a production of the Fairfax Network. Welcome back. We're here today with author Sharon Creech, and we're live. Our phone lines are open and ready to take your calls. Our number nationally is 1-800-231-6359. If you're calling us locally, you may reach us at 703 978-1636. Okay, if you've been wondering what a pair of moccasins plus a fortune cookie and a can of sardines and a theater ticket have in common, you're about to find out. All right, the fortune says, don't judge a man <laughs> until you've walked two moons in his moccasins. Sharon, would you explain what this, the message of this fortune for us? Well, I can explain the message, but also the significance <laughs> of the fortune cookie. The 
for me, the message being don't judge someone until you've had a chance to mm -hmm. walk in their shoes a while, to, to feel like you're in their place. And it was a lesson that I learned very deeply when I was teaching in England. I, I taught international students. And so you really got to see uh, the world from the perspective of many different nationalities. Mm -hmm. And I was really intrigued by all that my students had taught me. And the way it relates to me more personally into the book is that to walk to noons is that I uh, had written two drafts. It took me two years to write two drafts of that book, which the editor at the time would say, oh, well, it's nice, but it needs more. And one day I found in the bottom of my purse this fortune cookie. And I had received a fortune cookie at a Chinese restaurant in England with a Native American proverb in it, the one you've just <laughs> read. Right. And I thought, now that is very peculiar. But when I rediscovered it in the bottom of my purse, I thought, there's something about this that I'm writing about. Mm -hmm. now, I wasn't sure what it was. I went, I took a nap, and I call these now my inspiration naps, because when I woke up, I had this line in my head. Gramps says that I'm a country girl at heart, and that is true. And it's the first line of Walk to Noons. I just went straight to the computer and typed out that line, and I had this voice from this girl. It sort of somehow arose all from this cookie. And I think there's this, the whole suggestion of uh, the Native American mm -hmm. element in the book comes from this, the word moccasins in here and it sounded like someone going on a journey. Mm -hmm. So I took her on a journey, and I had no idea where we were going. I didn't know anything about her parents or her grandparents when we started. I just let her talk, and this voice just took over. So I strongly recommend that you save the fortunes <laughs> in your fortune cookie. And, <laughs> uh, and there's something to be said, too, for when you have a good idea like that, to write it down, right, because yes, you like may not remember that's it. That's right, write it Most down right away. <laughs> and of course, this is your Newbery Award winning book. Were you, were you surprised to receive the award? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's such a huge honor. It was. Remember, I was living in England at the time, and I hadn't, I didn't know much about children's literature. I knew of the Newbery Medal only as mm -hmm. a, a gold seal I'd seen on a book. And when I received that call, I really thought it was my brother joking. I, I said, Doug, cut <laughs> it out, come on. And then the woman convinced me that she was really from the Newbery yeah. co Committee and it really received the award. And I hung up the phone and I just started to cry because I knew it was somehow important, life-changing, mm -hmm. right. but I didn't really know how. And when the publisher called me about a half hour later, I said, how many of these awards are given out every year? Huh. Like 500? She said, Sharon, one. one. <laughs> and then I really cried because <laughs> I was so scared. But Let me stop you there because we have a call. Oh, good. Hi, what is your question today for Sharon? My name is Annie Birch, and I'm from Churchill Road Elementary School, Virginia. So Hi. my question is, how did you get the idea for writing Love That Dog? Oh, Annie, that's a good story. <laughs> uh, I had a poem sent to me by a friend called Love That Boy. It was written by Walter Dean Myers. And the first stanza goes, love that boy like a dog, like a rabbit loves to run. It starts like that. And I, I looked at this poem every day, and there's so much love for the boy in the poem. And one day I started wondering what the boy might love. And I thought, well, maybe his teacher, maybe a dog. And out of that, just all of a sudden, came this image in my head of a boy who loved his dog and loved his teacher. And the story just came out like that. It was very fortunate. Thanks for calling. We have another yeah. call. This is from Molly. Hi, Molly. What is your question today? Hi. Hi, Molly. My question is, what inspired you to write this book, Love That Dog? Why did you, why did you love this poem so much? I think because the rhythm of it, you know, it goes like, love that boy like a rabbit loves to run i said i love that boy like a rabbit loves to run love to call him in the morning love to call him hey there son don't you love that doesn't it make you want to dance and i just thought there's so much love in that poem i just wanted to find out more about that boy and that's i think why i had to write the story i was just so intrigued by that boy thanks for calling <laughs> molly sharon if you could walk in someone else's moccasins who would they be and why you know, I think everybody. <laughs> I think that's why I'm a writer, because I walk down the street, I see one, someone cleaning the street, and I wonder what that what that person's mm -hmm. life was. Or I go in the grocery store, and the woman who's ringing up the groceries, you know, sh she's got a story, and I want to find out what mm -hmm. it is. And so I couldn't choose just one person. I don't think. I think that's why I'll be able to keep writing stories, is because so many people intrigue me. Right. Who did you model the character of Sal after? I don't, I didn't consciously model her after anyone. 
she appeared in my head mm -hmm. pretty much full blown with this voice and I could see her sort of standing on a hill in Kentucky. Now, after the book was written, maybe a year after, I could see that what I had done was taken my younger self and my daughter and smooshed them into one because she's very much like me and my daughter, what we would be if you could squish us together like that. It's kind of a <coughs> combination. Right. Hi, we, ha we have another call. Okay. What is, please tell us your name and what is your question today for Sharon? This is Anna and I was wondering, do you have any sort of notebook in which you write your ideas? Ah, uh, notebook. Yeah. I used to have a notebook. In fact, I, I still do have notebooks around the house that sometimes I'll jot down an interesting name, sometimes a title of a book will come to me and I jot down the, that title. But I hardly ever refer to these notebooks and I think that's because if it's important enough, it stays in my brain. But n I use the notebooks now like insurance. <laughs> I think if I ever get stuck, I've got these notebooks mm -hmm. full of names and ideas and titles and stories. But I think it's helpful to young writers to keep notebooks, to just write down a description of something or an interesting piece of dialogue or a name that you hear that sounds interesting. And you can later use that as a great reference for when you write your own story. That's a great question, yeah. and it's, it's true. You might not think it's important at the time, but write it down anyway. You right. might use it later. Right. We have some more things here at the table. We have. Mm. A mm -hmm. can of sardines, <laughs> <laughs> and we have a theater ticket. Now, as the students would say, Sharon, what's <laughs> up with that? <laughs> well, those things appear on the cover of Replay. This is my newest book, and the boy in the book, na his name is Leo. Mm -hmm. He's 12 years old, and he's in a big Italian family, and he's in a play at school, so thus the theater tickets. Right. His nickname in his large Italian family is the sardine, thus this beautiful little how did you get such a nickname? <laughs> well, because one day when he was young and his relatives were over shouting and laughing and shaking their fists, he got squashed in a corner and he cried, I'm just a little sardine squashed mm -hmm. in a tin. And his family never let him forget that he called himself a sardine. And so it becomes, mm -hmm. they're using it in an endearing way, but he takes it to mean right. they still think I'm a little insignificant sardine. As a result, what he does is he replays scenes in his mind. So if in a, he has a scene in his family where he feels insignificant, then he, he sort of drifts off in his mind and he thinks, oh, he imagines himself in a scene where he's a hero. Maybe he saves someone's life or he, he invents something that mm -hmm. prevents heart attacks or that sort of thing. So he has this very rich imaginative life where he replays things. So you know. you've got a parallel going. He's actually in a play at school, right. and he, uh, he <coughs> plays out things in his mind of things that are actually going on in right. his life. Right, And at the back of the book, I should mention, is a copy of the play that he is supposedly in at school. It, the play is supposedly written by his teacher. So I, I wrote it. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a little strange. <laughs> we have another call coming in yes. as well. Okay. What is your question today? And please tell us your name. My name is Jose Rizari. Um, I'm from I'm calling from Chapel Trello Elementary in Flor in Pembroke Pines, Florida. And my question is how hard was it to write Walk to Moons? Uh, it was very hard to write Walk to Moons. I learned a lot though when I wrote that book. No book has been as hard since. I wrote two draft two complete drafts of that book, one year for each draft. And I was really ready to throw those drafts <laughs> in the rubbish uh, when I found that fortune cookie, which then allowed me to pull it all together and start again with a new character named Salamanca. So it was very hard to write that book. But sometimes really hard things are very good for you because you learn all a lot of lessons that way. I never had to repeat those hard lessons. And every book since then has been much easier to write. Good question. Yes, it is. Thanks for calling. Sharon, we're going to move on to some of your other books now. Okay. I know we have some Ruby Holler fans out there. <laughs> Here's an email from Bailey at Colvin Run Elementary School in Virginia. And Bailey writes, were there any childhood ideas or memories that you used in Ruby Holler? And if so, which ones? Uh, not consciously, but I, uh, there is a memory that relates to my father that sparked the whole book. My aunt, after my father died, my aunt wrote me a letter in which she was telling me a funny story about my father when she was young, and she ended the letter with this line, and that was when we lived in the holler. And I thought, holler? What holler? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know they'd right. ever lived in a holler. I began to imagine this place. I was just sort of spinning it in my mind. 
imagined it as this place of incredible beauty. And then I began to wonder, well, who might live in such a place? And out of that came these characters, Dallas and Florida, who live in the, who visit the holler, and an older couple who live there. And so the whole thing really came out of that wondering, what kind of mm -hmm. place was it that my father lived when he was young? Yeah. You ha you have such rich names for your characters, uh. regardless <laughs> of the book. How do you? Come <coughs> with the, a lot of the students are wondering, how do you come up with the names for your characters? I love to find interesting names yeah. and. When I was writing Walk Two Moons, I was looking at a map of western New York State. We have um, a cottage on that lake, mm -hmm. and the little town nearby is called Salamanca. And I thought that would be a great character's name because it could be short, you mm -hmm. could use a shortened version, Sal. And Salamanca sounds sort of Native American. Mm -hmm. And so that's where that name came from. Other names in that book, like Mrs. Cadaver, just popped yeah, into my head. Great name. <laughs> and then once you have the character's name, Mrs. Cadaver suggested something odd with death. Yeah. And so that's how she became connected to some of that in the book. Um, Phoebe Winterbottom. Phoebe is the name of um, the younger sister in Holden, the Holden Caulfield book. Um, why am I blanking on the, the book? Uh, you all know the book. <laughs> well, when you're older, you'll know the book. But anyway, I, I had always loved this uh -huh. character of the younger sister. And so I used her first name, Phoebe, and then thought she would have an odd last name. But when, I, when I'm on the road and I meet someone with an interesting name, if it's attached to an interesting personality especially, it sticks in my mind. Right. Cody, for instance, in The Wanderer came from a boy that I met at a book signing who was just an unusual, funny boy. And Sophie was a young girl I met in England. She was severely disabled, but mm -hmm. she had this really courageous spark. And so I borrowed her name for that character. That's terrific. We have another call. This is from Brennan. Hi, what is your question today for Sharon? My question is, is writing your favorite thing to do? And what do you do in your spare time? Ah, is writing my favorite thing to do and what do I do in my spare time? Writing is my favorite thing to do. I would do it all the time if, if I could, if real life didn't intervene. But in between, I have to do the grocery and laundry and um, take care of my husband and my children and grandchildren. Uh, so writing, yes, is a favorite thing, and in my spare time, I don't really have a lot of spare time, but I love to read, I like to go to the theater, I like to walk, kayak, swim, that sort of thing. You have a lot of hobbies. Mm -hmm. We have an, another email. This is from Kim at Mantua Elementary School in Virginia, and Kim <laughs> writes, I read The Wanderer and really liked it. I was curious, did you sail when you were Sophie's age? So Sophie's 13. Also, how did the idea for this book come to you? Uh, no, I didn't sail when I was 13, uh, but my daughter, when she graduated from college, she took a trip, she announced to me, she, <laughs> she was, let's see, 18? No, how old would she have been when she took, no, 19 maybe, mm -hmm. that she was taking a trip after graduation across the ocean in a 45-foot sailboat with six guys. Oh and I was, <laughs> as a mother, I I'm was a mother mortified. Too. Right, I was mortified. <laughs> and so while she, was take, but she said, you know, don't worry, yeah. Mom, they have GPS satellite, they all these safety things, we'll be fine. And while she was gone, I took a sailing class on an, a lake in Lake Chautauqua mm -hmm. just to try to understand what it felt like. I loved it, but I, sailing on a lake was plenty treacherous enough for mm -hmm. me. I couldn't even imagine what she was going through. No, I can't either. And when she reached Ireland at the end of three weeks, we got a phone call, and she said, Mom, we almost died. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> I was... <laughs> so both relieved and mortified again, yeah. but I thought, you know, this would make a great story sure. that, you know, she sets off on this trip with all guys, so it's a girl kind of having to prove mm -hmm. herself. They run into danger along the way. How do they cope with that danger, and how do they grow out of it? That's a terrific story. We yeah. have another phone call. This is from <laughs> Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. What is your question today? Is Jasmine there? Go ahead, Jasmine. Hello. My name is... Jameson Toulouse, from Is Shadow this Jameson? Okay. What um, is your question? My, my question is, what was it like writing books? What was it like writing books? Yeah. Well, I'm still writing books, so I guess I could answer that very well. <laughs> it's, to me, the most exciting thing because you start with a blank piece of paper. There are no words on it. I don't have any idea where the story is going. Maybe I have an image in my head of a character and a place. And I write 
in order to find out what the story is. And to me, that process is very exciting. Now, when it's not exciting is when you get stuck. Maybe in the middle you think, wow, all this stuff happened, but what happens next? So I have learned to just put it away mm -hmm. and take a walk or do something else. And then when I come back, I'm always able to pick it up again. Clears so your head a little bit. It does. We have another phone call. Go ahead, caller. What is your question? Hi, Mrs. Creech. This Hi. is Caroline from Maryland. I loved your book, Heartbeat, and I was wondering if the character Annie was at all like you at the same age. Hi. I think so. You know, I wasn't aware of that when I was writing. But again, after I finish writing the book and look back, I have a different opinion usually. And I think very much. I loved to escape the noise of my house by going outside and I loved to run. I, it just felt so free and I loved to be out in the air and just away from the noise and so very much like Annie in this book I would just run but I didn't like competitive things so again like Annie in the book I didn't want to join a track team I didn't want to make it work I wanted to just do it because it felt good to do so yes I am like her in a lot of ways <laughs> Thanks for calling. Good question. Uh, let's take a few more emails. Okay. This is from Stephen at Colvin Run Elementary, and he asked, how do you write your story <laughs> so that the reader feels like they're watching real <laughs> life that you <laughs> recorded? Well, that's a compliment. That's a, Thank you. Yes. Uh, I think perhaps it's because of the way the stories come to me. I see in my head a scene before I write it down. So mm -hmm. maybe it might just start with just a little bit. I see a girl standing on a hill. So I begin with what she's thinking, and I describe the area around her. And then I want to enlarge the focus a little bit. So I want to know right, what's beyond this little spot she's standing on, what's down the hill. Oh, that's her house. Who lives in her house? What's her family like? And so each thing for me is a mental image first, like you might see on film. Mm -hmm. And then I'm putting it into words. So maybe when the reader is reading it, he or she is reconstructing it back into this kind of image that I originally saw in my head. That's my best guess. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question because some students, as well as adults, find writing to be difficult. Right. Do you have some suggestions for writers of all ages? <laughs> yes, I do, especially for young writers. In, I think my best piece of advice would be to say, don't expect to be able to do it right away. Like mm -hmm. if you were learning tennis, for instance, you wouldn't go out and ex expect to just put on the duds and go out and, and play a full mm -hmm. game and win. You would expect, to, oh, maybe you have to go practice your forehand. Maybe you have to practice your backhand. You practice your serve. But it requires practice. It requires practice. It right. requires practice. Yes. Our guest today has been author Sharon Creech. If you would like to learn more about her books, go to her website at www.sharoncreech.com. To learn more about our upcoming authors and the Fairfax Network, visit us at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Della Kidd. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. <laughs>